Hello and welcome to today's EcoCast, supporting Microsoft-centric environments. Today's event is brought to you by Nutanix, Open Systems, Druva, and SolarWinds. If you haven't attended an EcoCast before, you should know that Actual Tech Media created the Megacast and EcoCast event series to help educate IT professionals such as yourselves about the latest and greatest in enterprise technology to help you do it as quickly and as efficiently as possible, to help you get all your questions answered and solve your enterprise technology challenges and have a chance to win some very valuable prizes as well. Now, before we get started, we have a little bit of housekeeping we first need to cover. We want this to be an educational event, so we encourage you to use the questions box, which is just to the right of the handouts tab that you should see to the left of your slides. If you click on questions, it's there that you'll want to enter your technology questions as we go throughout the event. We'll be queuing up the best questions for our dedicated Q&A sessions that we'll have with each of the presenters on today's event. We also want this to be a social event. You can tweet directly from your console using the Twitter icon on the bottom of the screen, and today's hashtag will be automatically appended. Now, we have a number of handouts or resources available from each of our presenters. Those are on the handouts tab in your console. You can go ahead and download those now and check them out after the event. And finally, prizes. We have a number of prizes available to be given away on the event today. In fact, we have three Amazon $500 gift cards you must be live in attendance to qualify for these drawings, and there are a number of other prize terms and conditions, which can be found at the bottom of the handouts tab, where you'll see a link to the Actual Tech Media prize terms and conditions. The winners of each of these gift cards will be announced verbally by the moderator during the event. All prize winners must submit an IRS Form W-9 to Actual Tech Media. Now, through the EcoCast and MegaCast event series, we have donated thousands of dollars to charities such as the charities you see on the screen here, thanks to generous attendees who win prizes and want to help make the world a better place. Now, through the Gorilla Guide Book Club partnership over at gorilla.guide, we have chosen this year to support the Dan Fossey Gorilla Fund to help better protect gorillas in the wild and the One Tree Planted charity to help plant trees around the world. You can learn more about the Gorilla Guide Book Club and download your free Gorilla Guide books over at Gorilla. Dot guide. The hashtag for today's event is ATM EcoCast. We'll be monitoring that hashtag over on Twitter. Again, feel free to use the Twitter widget on the bottom of your console to tweet directly with that hashtag. You can follow Actual Tech Media. We produce today's event and we post the latest and greatest enterprise technology content on our Twitter feed and LinkedIn page. You can follow us on Twitter at Actual Tech Media. And finally, the moderator for today's event will be Mr. James Green. You can follow James on Twitter. He is J.D. Green. Don't forget to subscribe to Actual Tech Media's Facebook page, YouTube channel, and our 10 on Tech podcast over in the iTunes store, as well as our LinkedIn page to make sure that you stay up to date on the latest and greatest in enterprise technology. And with that, it's time for today's keynote speaker. That is Mr. Ned Bellavance, Pluralsight author, MVP, technology expert, and all-around cloud guru. You can follow Ned on Twitter. He is Ned1313. And his blog is Ned in the Cloud. Make sure you check out Ned's courses around many different cloud technologies over in the Pluralsight.com video training library. And with that, take it away, Ned. Hey, everyone. This is Ned Bellavance, and I am going to be talking about unifying your cloud management before it's too late. That may be a bit of an overstatement, but hopefully I got your attention. So why am I talking about unifying your cloud management approach? It's because the deployment model has been shifting from our traditional data centers where let's say we had our monitoring tool and our data management tool and we had our networking tool and those were good enough for the data center. And then we added cloud and maybe we went to AWS, right? And AWS, they've got their own tools for all these things. You've got AWS for monitoring, for backup. They've got their own networking constructs. And now your operations team has another set of tools to deal with. But that's cool because your operations team is awesome and they're totally able to deal with these additional tools that have been laid upon them. But then you had to deploy some stuff in Azure, and now it's yet another set of tools they have to manage. And maybe later you're going to deploy to GCP or Alibaba Cloud. The burden of the multiple tool sets is going to become too much for your operations team to handle, which means you need to find unified tool sets for all of these different functions. What are some of the common features that you should look for in a unified tool set? Well, this seems kind of obvious, but you're 
toolset should support multiple clouds. That's the whole point of having a unified toolset. Not only that, but it should support the specialized features in each cloud. I mean, there's a reason that you went to AWS and then went to Azure for different features. It was those specialized features that attracted you in the first place. It should also have a single management console. And this seems obvious as well, but I've seen more than one solution that had a console for on-prem and a console for AWS and maybe a separate console for GCP. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't help you from a tools perspective. And finally, it should have some level of redundancy to protect against failures in the cloud. Let's take a closer look at some of the features that you might want for monitoring. In the multi-cloud world, it needs to be able to monitor not just the workloads you've deployed in a cloud, but also the control plane of the cloud itself. And it should have redundancy in each cloud. If an availability zone goes down or a region goes down, your monitoring tool should continue to work. In terms of specialized features, your monitoring tool should be able to handle not just infrastructure as a service, but all the platform as a service options that exist out there. Your monitoring tool needs to be application aware because applications can span more than one cloud, more than one service. Your monitoring tool needs to be able to understand the context of a particular service as part of a larger application. And finally, your monitoring tool needs to have automated workflows that take advantage of the cloud native APIs that exist in whatever clouds you've chosen to deploy in. From a data management perspective, if we're looking at multi-cloud, your data management tool needs to be able to manage data in each cloud. So whatever data you put in Azure or AWS, it needs to be able to manage that data. It also needs to be able to move data around to each cloud. And that has a lot to do with archiving and data lifecycle management. In terms of specialized features, your data management tool needs to support multiple different platforms as a service within each cloud. So if you have a Kubernetes cluster or you're using DynamoDB, it should be able to help you out with those. It also needs to support all the different storage types there. So we're talking blob and block and even file storage within each cloud. It should also have some sort of data lifecycle management that understands the multiple clouds you're in and is able to place data in a way that is not only performance, but also cost efficient. And finally, it needs to have universal search. This is a must have for any data management tool that you're considering today. For networking, we're mostly thinking about hybrid connectivity here. So what sort of features need to exist in that tool? Well, it needs to be able to configure the networking inside each cloud. And it also needs to be able to configure networking between each cloud because as you move to multi-cloud, you're going to want to connect those clouds and your on-premises data centers. It also needs to support specialized features within the clouds. And I'm talking about things like security groups in AWS or VNet peering in Azure. And it needs to support dedicated circuits to those clouds. So it has to understand how to work with Express Route or Direct Connect. It should ideally be able to balance traffic between the clouds and minimize the amount of egress traffic you're getting from those clouds, because that's the thing you actually get charged for. You get charged on egress of data from your different clouds. And finally, it needs to have a way to model changes because your network is getting really complex now. It needs to be able to model changes and potentially evaluate what's going to happen if you put that change in place. Those are three categories to look at when you're unifying your cloud management strategy. But there are other categories that I would recommend taking a look into as well, like security, compliance, automation, and cost optimization. These are all hugely important for how you manage your multi-cloud environment. Well, that's all the time I have. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the EcoCast. Uh, this is James Green, moderator for today's event, and go ahead and keep going. So um, to help set the stage for uh, the rest of the event, I'm curious to know uh, if you've got an active project right now or you're just coming up on one, especially as it relates to Microsoft-centric environments, um, what is the time frame for that project? Um, software, hardware, it could be anything. Um, as we go through the event today, we're going to be doing some Q&A, and we're going to be trying to 
uh, address topics that you're dealing with directly. And so uh, this will help us as we address those questions to just to know, you know, uh, are you just thinking way out or are you working on a project right now and you've got things that you need to solve right this minute? This is, is helpful information to have. So based on what I'm seeing so far, it looks like just kind of a, a little bit of everything with a heavy skew towards not exactly working on a specific deadline right now, just looking for information. So that's very helpful for us to know. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, with that, we're going to move on to the first presentation today, um, which is from our presenter, Anne. Anne is from Druva. Anne, uh, thanks for joining us on the, on the uh, Ecocast today. Hi, James. Thank you so much. And welcome, everybody. Hello. Uh, I'm excited to be talking to you today about your Office 365 backup strategy. And uh, as James mentioned, my name is Anne Rosen. I am the uh, Director of Product Marketing here at Druva, responsible for end-user data protection solution, which also includes Office 365 uh, data protection. So let's jump right in. Of course, we all know about the meteoric rise of Office 365. Uh, and the rapid adoption of the solution by many organizations. That's why we're all here today. Um, so Office 365 is a wonderful collaboration and productivity suite of tools that is hosted in the cloud. Um, what is really interesting is that as organizations are moving their application from on-premises to the cloud, some interesting perceptions have come about that have uh, kind of puzzled us in the backup industry, both vendors as well as analysts. Uh, thankfully, a lot of these perceptions are now turning around, but I would actually like to test this with you, my friends in the audience. So let me actually ask you a question. So I am using Office 365 and my data is in the cloud with Microsoft. So Microsoft has my back, right? So therefore, I do not need to back up my data. Is that right? So what do you think? What, what were you answering in your head? Uh, well, you know, let's consult with Gardner. Let's see what Gardner had to say about that. So Gardner actually said that assuming SaaS applications don't require backup is dangerous. So I don't know if you've read any number of Gardner reports in the past. I'm sure you're all aware that Gardner doesn't commonly use superlatives like that. So I think that is very telling. So if you're thinking that you may not need to backup your Office 365 data, I guess that depends. I would ask you, do you li like to live life dangerously? What is your risk tolerance? That is something you need to answer for yourself. And um, not only did Gardner uh, say those things, but even Microsoft themselves, you know, to answer our previous questions, cloud application does not equal backup. And Microsoft themselves, in fact, tell you in their uh, services agreement, if you go and read the, the fine print, you will find out that Microsoft actually recommends that you regularly back up your content and data that you store on their services. And they furthermore um, go and discuss what they call a shared responsibility model. And so basically what that means is that Microsoft is responsible for the application, for the infrastructure the application runs on, and making sure everything runs smoothly. What you, the customer, are responsible for is the data. You have full accountability for the data. Um, if anything goes wrong with your data, for example, it gets attacked by ransomware or um, you have accidental data deletion, it is really up to you to be able to recover that. And in fact, Microsoft really has no obligation to help you recover your data in the event of a loss. So, um, for example, if you lose your data and you, know, you cannot recover it, you can call Microsoft. They may try to help you, but here's the catch. They have provided no SLAs upon which they will help you provide your data recovery. So 
in fact, um, we have heard some reports from our analysts that customers have told them that in some cases, Microsoft has flat out refused to help them recover their data. So at the end of the day, um, it is really up to you to protect this data. Um, and not only that, we believe that we're actually seeing a trend in the industry right now where SaaS vendors are actually moving away from uh, protecting that data and helping customers recover this data. So for example, you may have seen a recent announcement from Salesforce, another notable SaaS vendor. Um, they have announced that starting uh, July of this year, so a few short months from now, they're going to be EOLing their uh, end of life their previous data recovery capability. So starting July of this year, if you're using Salesforce and you are not backing up your data and then you lose your data, you're kind of out of luck. That data is gone forever. So these are all things you need to keep in mind when you want to make sure that you're protecting your Office 365 data against any risks. So what could go wrong with your data? Well, a lot could go wrong. For starters, let's talk about ransomware. So ransomware is definitely a very much a rising threat. There has been a huge increase in the instances of ransomware. According to Forrester, there's been a 500% year-over-year increase in the incidence of ransomware. Um, and um, companies are talking about some very high costs for recovery from ransomware. So for example, one company that we're showing here on the screen has reported that they estimated $40 million to recover from ransomware. Now keep in mind, the actual cost of the ransom is only a fraction of your recovery cost because recovery also includes things like actually recovering your data uh, and then any types of loss to productivity, loss to business continuity, loss to revenue, loss of customers. There's lots of things that you could lose, not the least of which is your reputation. So it's really important to have a good strategy for both defending against ransomware as well as recovering from ransomware. Uh, next, what we want to talk about is regulation. There is a massive increase in regulation that we have to contend with. Uh, we have GDPR. We have now CCPA coming out in California, just, has just come out, uh, and more are waiting in the wings with other states that are very similar. Uh, there is HIPAA, there is so many regulation, and unfortunately, there is very heavy fines that organizations are getting slapped with. So making sure that your data is compliant with regulation is super important. And last but not least, this is actually a data risk that is, is not really often in the deadline, in the headlines, excuse me. Uh, however, um, it is actually the most common type of data loss according to many studies. So we're talking about accidental data loss. So the example we have here is one that we hear from many of our customers, whereby they accidentally delete a bunch of files, and if they don't have a backup solution, um, you know, they basically call Microsoft because you know this data is on Office 365, so they assume Microsoft can help them, but that is really not always the case. Uh, in this particular example, the customer didn't have Office 365 backup. They had called Microsoft seven times trying to reco recover um, a few thousand files of SharePoint that they accidentally deleted and Microsoft just couldn't help them recover this data. So this is the type of compelling event that actually drives the customer to come to Druva and seek data protection for Office 365 because they kind of find out the hard way that Office 365 does not provide sufficient protection for their data and then they come looking for a third-party data protection solution. And this actually jives really well with uh, what Gardner says about Office 365 native ca capabilities, and especially as they are compared to a third-party backup solution. So the big issue with Office 365 is that it does not provide data isolation. Uh, this is the 3 2, one that we usually talk about in the backup world. And so in the words of Gardner, um, they say that unlike data protection solutions, Office 365 does not create an independent, accessible, external copy of the data. And they also further talk about the fact that recycling bins, 
do not really meet Gartner's definition of backup. And finally, and probably most importantly, um, they talk about the fact that Office 365 offers limited recovery from ransomware as well as file corruption. And here on the right of the screen, you're seeing an example uh, of a ransomware attack that happened on Office 365 that was in the headlines. But of course, we at Druva hear about all the stories that are not in the headlines, usually don't make it there because nobody wants to talk about the ransomware attack they just had. Um, but we definitely hear those customers that have Office 365 get corrupted by ransomware and when they come to us to get it recovered. So at the end of the day, the way you want to think about it is this. Office 365 is a business critical application. Think about what would happen if you lost this data. Could your organization function and survive without this data? And you want to think about it in the context of your data center. Your data center also hosts business critical applications. And how do you back up this data center? Would you ever consider, for example, not using 3 to 1 to back up your business critical applications in your data center? Or would you consider letting end users access your backup stores in the data center? Well, you know that is kind of what you're doing with Office 365 because um, you have recycling bins, versions, OneDrive. These are all accessible by your end users. And so, at the end of the day, you really need to decide, you know, how concerned are you about these risks and can you actually um, assume these risks with your Office 365 data. So we spend a little bit of time talking about why we want to back up Office 365 data. Now let's delve a little bit deeper in and let's talk about five key risks to your Office 365 data, and what are some best practices that you can undertake to protect yourself against those risks? So first of all, this is the most benign type of data loss, but it's also the most common type of data loss according to uh, several studies, accidental deletion uh, or accidental data loss is the most common type of data loss. Uh, and this could include things like I accidentally deleted my files, or somebody accidentally overwrote uh, my files in the course of collaboration. And this is something that happens all the time because, as we mentioned, Office 365 is a collaboration suite. People can write each other's data, overwrite each other's data, and that happens all the time. Um, and finally, data can also get corrupted um, in the course of data synchronization which is at the core of technologies like um, Microsoft uh, OneDrive. So um, when you talk about the accidental data loss, you know, you may be thinking to yourself, okay, well, if I accidentally delete this file, I can just recover it from my recycling bin, right? Well, you know, you're only partially right because the issue with the native recovery capabilities that Office 365 offers is that they don't really work very well for all scenarios of data loss. So for example, in this case of deleting my file and it goes into the recycling bin, um, since I don't know that I actually did this, uh, if I find out about this deletion or overwrite uh, within the retention window of the recycling bin, so the data in the recycling bin can potentially uh, only last in there between 30 and 93 days. So if I find out about this outside of this retention window, then this data is going to be lost forever. So that is one example um, of data loss. Another scenario that is very common with Office 365 is when an administrator accidentally deletes a whole bunch of share, uh, SharePoint files or sometimes they may accidentally delete a whole SharePoint site. Um, what happens in this case is that, first of all, uh, it may be lost outside of their retention window. But when SharePoint uh, file is lost, that affects your website. And if you are losing a massive number of SharePoint file, 
trying to recover those with the native capabilities that are offered by Office 365 is very painful and very com complex and time consuming and it's probably not going to go that well and you're probably going to end up trying to call Microsoft, they may or may not help you. Um, so this is really something to consider and in addition to that, with, uh, off, with um, SharePoint recovery offered by Microsoft, you can only recover the files in place. You cannot recover them into a different location. And also finally, um, data can get corrupted uh, by uh, the synchronization technology that uh, is included in OneDrive. So if this has probably happened to some of you. You would try to synchronize a file and you get a synchronization error or the file may get damaged or deleted and that file gets actually lost. Um, so these are just a few examples of accidental data loss. But in all of these cases, having a third-party solution like Druva means that your data is never lost because all your data is regularly backed up into uh, isolated, immutable snapshots of data. And so you can always recover from there. But just as important, uh, we offer very flexible and very granular recovery options in order to address every scenario of Office 365 data loss. So for example, um, in, in these two scenarios that we discussed, if I just lose a file, accidentally delete it, and I may find out about this outside of the retention window, I can easily use self-service capabilities from Druva to very quickly recover this single file. But in the other example, which is I accidentally just deleted 10,000 SharePoint files, well, in this case, what you want is actually bulk recovery led by IT, and you want to be able to recover only those files that were deleted. You don't want to have to restore your entire site accidentally um, losing other work that has been uh, put in place in the meantime. Um, so in addition to that, if your data gets corrupted, as a proven backup technology, Druva does offer five-ninths of data durability, so you can always recover to a clean data from Druva. So we talked about this uh, more benign type of data loss. Now let's move to talking about a couple of more um, sinister events, if you will. So first off, if you thought you only had to worry about um, outside threats, if that was not enough, we now also need to contend with the uh, insider bad actors that can cause damage to your data. So for example, there have been reports of employees that are leaving the company and upon departure, they may delete files in bulk. And additionally, there's also been incidents of rogue admins that are causing a lot of damage to data. They have a lot of access. Uh, what is really ironic is due to the fact that Office 365 is a collaboration suite, each and every one of us has the much more power to cause damage to the corporation data because we can not only recover, um, we can not only delete our own files, but we can also delete the files of our colleagues. And so we can cause much more damage if any disgruntled employee leaves the company, they can cause much more damage. Now the issue with the native Office 365 capabilities is that to Office 365, an event like this would just seem like a benign activity, just somebody deleting files. Office 365 has no way to distinguish whether this is uh, just a random uh, activity by a user or this is a bad actor causing significant damage to the organization. Uh, and if this is discovered, you know, if somebody does that and leaves the company, this may be discovered only after a while. And so if this is discovered after the retention window or outside the Office 365 retention window, that data may be lost forever. Uh, and even if you catch this in time, and even if you catch this right away, the typical native recovery capability that Office 365 provides are not really designed to address this type of loss because you've just lost data in bulk. You may have lost thousands of files. It is very painful, very complex, and time-consuming to try to recover that with the native Office 365 capabilities. However, if you have a solution like Druva, 
First of all, uh, we provide anomaly detection and alerts. So, for example, we could alert your IT department if somebody is deleting an unusual high volume of files. And that could then trigger an event with the IT and the InfoSec team who can go and investigate. We provide forensic capabilities for the InfoSec team to understand the scope and the dimensions of the attack. And then, I mentioned earlier, we provide a very flexible, very granular recovery capabilities. So you could use our bulk recovery capabilities to recover all the files that have been lost. And not only that, you could also recover those files to any location. So for example, you could recover those files to the employee's uh, manager system. Uh, so as you can see, uh, with Druva, you're always protected in this type of an event. Now, moving from bad to worse, let's now talk about ransomware. So we mentioned this earlier, ransomware is really IT's worst nightmare. This is definitely not something that you want happening on your watch. And the ransomware attacks are increasing, the attacks are getting more and more sophisticated, um, and this is a threat that you really need to be protecting yourself against. Now, thankfully, there is now pretty widespread consensus that your best line of defense against ransomware is a backup strategy. But it's not enough to just have any backup, and let me bring in Gardner here again um, what Gardner talks about is that not only do you need to have a backup to protect yourself from ransomware, you also need to make sure that your backup is actually air-gapped. Air-gapped, basically, that is the data isolation that we discussed earlier. Um, and why this is important is because ransomware can actually infiltrate your um, systems and actually reside within your environment for a very long time undetected, and it just kind of quietly spreads throughout your system, and it starts crawling and infecting files. And what happens is that the ransomware, in this case, um, would spread around not only infecting your primary data, but it can also infect any unprotected or unairgapped, unisolated uh, data backup stores. So this is really critical for uh, protecting yourself and recovering from ransomware. So um, if you think about it, uh, and you look at Office 365 capabilities when it comes to ransomware, they definitely have put in place um, some good capabilities to prevent ransomware from enter entering your Office 365 capabilities. Um, however, while they have good uh, defenses in place, no defense is ever foolproof, and at the end of the day, some ransomware attacks are going to get through. And this is why we keep saying headlines about these ransomware attacks, and this is why we here at Druva are hearing uh, about customers that their Office 365 data got infected by ransomware. So at the end of the day, uh, what you need to also realize is that um, OneDrive uses synchronization technology. And because of that, um, that can cause exacerbation of the ransomware spreading throughout your organization. And it can spread to versions. It can spread to recycling bins. Um, and if you couple that with the fact that Office 365 does not offer data isolation as expected and required by Gartner, um, we feel that when it comes to recovering from ransomware, Office 365 capabilities really do fall short. So, and even if your recovery is possible, it will be very, very uh, painful, manual. Um, the issue is really that Office 365 heavily relies on the end users to self-serve um, when they are recovering or trying to recover from ransomware. And all of this does not really lend itself to good recovery from ransomware. Uh, when you go with a solution like Druva, first of all, we do alert you to unusual data activity. So um, if there is some unusual um, anomalous 
activity happening, like mass deletions of files, that is going to alert your IT and your InfoSec team so they can go and investigate. This would alert to a, the potential presence of a ransomware attack. Um, and not only that, they could then um, use federated search and forensic capabilities that we provide in order to determine the scope of the um, attack as well as when it started. Um, and this gives us the ability to really effectively recover from the attack um, because um, we know when it started, we know when we have clean backup, and we also provide a workflow to recover from ransomware. So um, unlike the situation in Microsoft Office 365, where you're actually relying on end user to do a lot of the recovery, this is not really what you want. Uh, when you have a ransomware attack, um, you really want IT and InfoSec to step in, uh, and you really want to be able to bulk recover your data from a clean, isolated copy of your backup. And this is what we do um, here at Druva. So this is all really critical in order to quickly recover and return to business continuity after a massive attack like this. Um, next, um, I want to talk about a couple of governance uh, and regulation topics that are pretty hot these days that um, are really important for you to keep in mind when it comes to your Office 365 data. And this is where a solution like Druva can also help you address these items. Um, so first of all, e-discovery and legal hold. So e-discovery is basically the process of gathering data for legal proceedings. So this is, if you think about it, this is like data as evidence uh, in legal proceedings. And this is, especially given the increase of corporate litigation, this is becoming a very important requirement for organizations everywhere. And e-discovery is a very time-consuming and costly and can truly text and, and put a lot of an impact on an IT department if you're not prepared for this with the right tools. So when you look at uh, Office 365 native capabilities for e-discovery, uh, they do provide uh, pretty decent capabilities to uh, conduct e-discovery on Office 365 data. But if you think about e-discovery in a more holistic way, data that you need for e-discovery does not reside only on Office 365. So for example, an end user that is involved in some type of legal action may also have data that is not Office 365 files that is located on their laptop. Data could reside in other locations. Um, so the big difference here with Druva is that we do think about this holistically, and we do provide you with e-discovery and legal hold support that provided across your ecosystem of data. So not only Office 365 data, but also any data located on end-user systems and devices, uh, as well as data residing in other SaaS applications, like for example, G Suite or Slack. Uh, in addition to that, we offer a faster export speeds, um, as well as support multiple file formats, and we also um, integrate with um, popular e-discovery platforms like Xtero. And so this enables you to rapidly upload the data to those e-discovery platforms so that the e legal team can immediately start reviewing this data. And the beauty here is that we do all this from a single console, from a single pane of glass across all your systems where this data might reside. So next, uh, another governance topic that I want to talk about is actually compliance as well as retention when it relates to compliance. So again, as we mentioned earlier, regulations are just becoming extremely uh, prominent and a big line item for organizations to address. So regulations like GDPR, CCPA, other regulations coming out, HIPAA, it's really become a non-option uh, for, um, for companies to ignore this. And that is because of the massive fines that could be slapped on you if you don't comply with those regulations. So um, if you look at this in the context of Office 365, um, once again, as I mentioned in the context of e-discovery, uh, Office 365 
does provide solid uh, support for compliance when it comes to Office 365 data. But once again, you could have compliance violations outside of Office 365. So if you remember the example we showed in the beginning of the presentation, we had a laptop um, that got stolen. As a result of that, the company had uh, a big HIPAA fine because there was a violation of HIPAA on that stolen laptop. So you need to think about compliance holistically. Um, and the beauty with uh, working with a company like Druva is that we do provide compliance monitoring as well as giving you an opportunity to act on non-compliance and we provide that not only for Office 365 but across other systems, for example, your end user devices or G Suite where a lot of this vi uh, violating data could actually reside. Um, and we also provide um, unlimited retention of audit logs which are very important in the event of an audit. Um, and finally, uh, when it comes to retention, a lot of companies in certain industries have regulation related to data retention. So for example, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, you need to retain data for seven years. So if you're in that industry and you work with Jova, we provide you indefinite retention and help you comply with this regulation. Additionally, companies in certain industries have regulation pertaining to uh, having an isolated copy of their backup data in order to support disaster recovery. Uh, once again, if you work with a company like Juva, we do provide isolated immutable copy of your backup and that is really important uh, to comply with those types of disaster recovery regulations. And? So, Yes. We're about 10 minutes over time here, and I do have a question I want to ask you from the audience before yes. we yes. finish up. Of so course. I'm going to have to ask yes. you to bring us in for landing here. Okay. All right. Um, so really quickly, I alluded to this. Um, we talked about our capabilities to support Office 365. Um, we do support all popular Office 365 workloads, including Exchange Online, SharePoint, OneDrive, as well as Teams. And for these workloads, we provide all these capabilities we discussed earlier, the core backup and recovery, ransomware recovery, search and audit, as well as e-discovery and um, compliance. Um, we actually offer these capabilities not only for end-user uh, end data on Office 365, but also across popular cloud applications, as well as end-user devices. Uh, we provide these value-add capabilities across these different workloads. And Druva also supports um, AWS workloads as well as data center workloads. Uh, and really, we're all about helping you meet your recovery SLAs. Uh, we are a fully SaaS solution. We provide all the TCO and innovation agility that you want and why you go to Office 365 solution in the first place. Um, and um, Finally, our customers tell us that we're so easy to use and have the best um, customer service. Uh, you can go to any peer review sites and you can see that very prominently. Um, we have over 4,000 customers. We're natively built on AWS. We're one of their strategic partners. And we are managing 150 petabytes uh, of our customers. And, and this is just a quick example uh, of one of our customers, San Jose Sharks, our local hockey team. Um, they found out that Office 365 native capabilities does not uh, provide sufficient backup support for their critical data. And they turned to Druva for Office 365 backup and realized cost benefits as well as significant benefits in reducing IT time. Um, and with that, James, uh, I apologize. I do want to give a chance for a couple of questions for our audience. So what do we have? Great. Thanks so much, Anne. Um, while we do this, I'm going to flip up a poll question here. Uh, and then I have collected a couple of good questions while we're going. Um, first one, somebody in the audience is asking, Office 365 does provide some level of ransomware protection. So uh, why is it that, that you're saying that's not sufficient, if, if we understood you correctly? That is a really good question that we often discuss. So. Um, so, as, so Office 365 does provi provide good prevention capabilities. In other words, 
trying to prevent ransomware from entering into your environment, and that prevention is good, but no prevention is bulletproof. So eventually sure. some ransomware attack is going to get in, and this is when you need to think about recovery. And as I discussed earlier, in order to successfully recover from a ransomware attack, you need isolated snapshots of your data in backup, and you also want to be able to have IT and InfoSec-led bulk recovery of your data so that you can resume business continuity. Got it. Okay. Um, two related questions here. The first one, we talked a lot about Office 365. Are there other platforms that you can help protect as well? Oh, that is a great question. So uh, we have a pretty broad uh, solution to protect end-user data. Uh, so we protect not only Office 365, we also protect G Suite, we protect Salesforce, we protect Salesforce, um, and we also protect all your end-user desktops, laptops, mobile devices. Um, and we do all of this from a single pane of glass. So we really are a platform play. We're very unique in the industry in that sense. And not only does our platform protect end user data, it also protects other key workloads like data center workloads as well as AWS workloads. Got it. Okay. And then last question, which is a different look at a similar kind of question. Uh, one of our Canadian friends is asking, uh, can you help them too? And so I guess let's even level that up another notch. It, can you help uh, just in North America, globally? What, what's the situation there? Oh, yeah, that is a great question. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, Druva is born on AWS. So we're a native AWS solution. And because of that, we are happy to say that we have a very large global footprint because we basically follow the AWS global footprint. So we support and provide the capability in 15 availability zones on AWS, uh, and we're happy to follow up with this particular um, member uh, of the audience uh, to find out specifically what you're looking for. But I think you mentioned Canada, so that is definitely uh, covered in our availability zone. We have a pretty, pretty broad uh, global footprint here at Druva. Very good. Okay. Well, thank you, Anne, so much for joining us on the EcoCast today. Thank you, James, and thank you to my friends in the audience. See you next time. Okay, we are going to move on and welcome our next presenter, but quickly before we do that, uh, I have a gift card to give away. Uh, the winner of the first gift card is going to be Benjamin Chow from California. Benjamin, congratulations, and we'll be in touch to deliver that gift card via email after the event. So with that, we're going to move on to hear from Open Systems. Uh, Sylvain Shoup is here, and he's going to talk to us uh, about open systems. Sylvain, thanks for joining us on the EcoCast today. Excellent. Thank you, James. Hello, everyone, also from my side. I'm Sylvain Shoup, and I'm heading the solution architecture team at Open Systems. And I'm very excited to talk to you today about this topic, because uh, when we design solutions um, the best fit our customers' needs, Microsoft products are always um, at the forefront. You simply cannot design a secure SD-WAN um, or deploy it even without making sure that you support Microsoft Teams, Wipe Solutions, Office 365, or even Azure deployments. So that's a very good fit. And before kind of showing you a couple of use cases of how actually we leverage Microsoft-centric environments and how we, we ensure that customers can stay in control there, I want to quickly look at some cloud and mobility trends and why today's customers or why customers need um, SASE these days. So as we all know, we work differently these days as, as we've done a couple of years ago. Applications and data, they move everywhere. They move to the cloud. And most companies today, they have a multi-cloud strategy. So what do we mean with multi-cloud? In the end, it could be a, a variety of things. So it can be that you as a company, you adopt different cloud service providers, for example, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, or, or others. But it could also simply mean that you have a, a hybrid mix between on-prem installations and cloud deployments. 
But also, it could mean that you leverage different cloud types, so to say, from a single provider. So meaning that you could use um, Office 365 as a typical class SaaS application. You could have some Azure infrastructure as a service deployment, or even leverage some platform as a service. So really, we see that most companies these days, they do have um, such a hybrid mix of, uh, of multi-cloud environments. But it's not only the endpoints and applications that are everywhere, um, or <laughs> applications and data that is everywhere, but it's really also the endpoints and the users that access this data. It's really we are as mo mobile and, and dispersed these days as never before, and that poses a lot of additional challenges to, to the IT environment. Because essentially, when we look at at the security perspective of things, we cannot rely anymore on our classic security perimeter where we kind of have a fence um, around our internal network and we consider everything that is internal as, as good as our friends and everything outside or our um, enemies. So really this perimeter is, is getting more and more irrelevant and we have to find solutions how we can enable the business in, in going to the cloud but still staying under control and ensure that our users, our endpoints, and eventually all our data is secure and protected. And this is really why Gartner recently came up with a new market category. They called it a SASE, that stands for Secure Access Service Edge, and really kind of provides um, a field for a combination of managed services around network and security. It's really the combination of the challenges to, to connect multiple um, branch sites, multiple users, multiple cloud installations together while doing or while staying secure at the same time. So having this in mind, keeping this as kind of the back, background of it, I want to now dive into three different use cases that, that we see our um, customers struggle with when they adopt the cloud. And what's good with Microsoft is they are as, as broad and their product portfolio is so widely adopted that all of these scenarios um, you will face sooner or later whenever you are um, heavily invested into Microsoft products. But it's in the end, it's not only Microsoft. It's really no matter what you do these days, you will face those challenges uh, here or then. So first of all, I want to look at a case where you have some uh, infrastructure as a deployment um, or as a service deployment in, in Azure, in some particular Azure region, and you have the, the challenge to connect your on-prem network, your wide area network to this um, cloud deployment. The simplest case here is, is most often just you kind of have some sort of um, box inside, some firewall, and you just um, set up an IPsec tunnel from your on-prem location to, the, to Azure, and that's very simple to do. Pretty much every cloud service provider um, supports that out of the box, and um, it's the, the easiest way to, to connect anything to the cloud. The problem is that while this perfectly well um, serves you for, for test environments or for, for, let's say, some development environments, we're not sure that this serves the purpose if you really have production traffic going um, back and forth between on-prem and, and the cloud. Because the problem with those so-called uh, half tunnels is that you do not have any visibility and you lack um, any management and support. And that's really why we kind of refer to them as half tunnels, because only one side of, of the, uh, the tunnel is managed, and hence you kind of um, yeah, as long as things run good, you are fine, but as soon as there is some problems with the connection, you are left on your own. That's why open systems, we advocate for um, our full tunnel solution, and that's really where we as a, as a secure SD-WAN provider, we, we recommend to deploy uh, an SD-WAN appliance into your cloud environment as a, as a virtual appliance, so to say, and that means we, we basically handle your cloud environment as, um, as if it was just you plenty of benefits, right? It, it, um, it 
seamlessly integrate your cloud deployment into your wide area network. It's narrowly connected directly with whatever location needs access to this cloud environment. And you immediately get the full management, the full visibility and the support that you are used to from getting um, from a managed um, SUM provider. What is also important here is to mention that um, having a, such a secure SUN appliance in your cloud environment immediately gives you um, some security uh, options there. So we mean that by, by this we mean that you have a full security stack available in your Azure VNet that not only helps you protect your workloads, for example, with a firewall, but it also helps to detect and respond, respond to any threats. So our box, as we see all traffic going through, we have IDS capabilities, advanced threat capabilities, so we can really have sensors placed into your cloud environment and make sure that you get the same visibility and the same security as you are, you, um, are used to from, um, from your on-prem deployment. And this really brings me to an important point to, um, in this use case here, because in the end, you might ask yourselves, why do I even should care about security in the cloud? Doesn't Microsoft do that for me? The answer is no. Microsoft, in fact, as much as Google and, uh, and Amazon and other cloud providers, they only care about securing their environment. They make sure that the Azure environment stays as secure as it has to be, uh, but whatever workloads you deploy in there, you have your sole responsibility. And if you start to look into this closely, you see that the default behavior in Azure is actually more in favor of agility and in favor of easy deployment than it is in favor of um, having a secured environment. And you really need to think about what policies and processes do you put in place to get a control of this and to make sure that whatever database or whatever um, virtual machine you put in there, whatever web server, that you still have or think about the protection to make sure that um, these servers are not exposed to the internet and hence not exposed to, to whatever threats we know are out there. So we've seen in this use case that infrastructure as a, as a service um, provides great benefits to everyone. We all love it. But it also provides challenges when we wanted to connect to it, connect to it as seamlessly um, integrated into our existing network, but at the same time also stay under control and have the security um, enforcement in place that we want it um, to be. Nextly, I want to focus on software as a service, right? That's kind of the second use case we've seen before that typical um, customers or typical enterprise these days, we, we use about 1,200 SaaS applications in average. So this is a, a recent study that came out and it's, it's unbelievable. If you talk to, to IT people, they would probably guess a few dozen, maybe a few hundreds, but you hardly hear that people are aware of how many applications actually the end users consume and how little of them are actually sanctioned by, by the IT department. So you really want to make sure that, that you can stay under control while still enabling the business to leverage all the great benefits of this. So when we again at first look at how do you enable your mobile workforce to, to leverage SaaS applications, right? It's the great benefit of it. You want to access it no matter where you are, on no matter what device you work on. And the benefit is because SaaS applications are in the cloud, you can just access them from anywhere. The problem here is this flexibility exposes not only the application on the one side, exposes data, exposes um, whatever uh, the application is running on, but it also exposes the end user, exposes the, the device that the end user is, is using. And again, we lack visibility. We don't have any management and support if there is any problem for, for the end users on the road. That's where we say a great alternative here is to not have your end users access SaaS applications directly, but that we actually 
route them over Cloud Security Hub. So we have them dial in through a secure tunnel to an endpoint that is running on Azure or AWS or wherever it needs to be, obviously as close to, to where your end users are. And hence, we have the capability of inspecting the traffic that is going out to SaaS applications, but also make sure that, that users um, stay compliant with whatever policies you have internally. Latency comes up as a big question here often because you can argue that um, this additional detour or the additional hop that you take here um, is user notice noticeable or impacts the end user experience. But in most cases, this is actually not the case because, for example, Microsoft invests heavily into a, uh, their um, global network. So they manage to optimize the peerings to hundreds of SaaS providers. So if you, from your, wherever you are, from your hotel, from your Starbucks, you typically have very good connectivity into the Microsoft network. And from there, you're often even faster to your SaaS provider than you would be if you just used the, the regular internet backbone. So there is a lot of um, opportunity and a lot of um, benefit if we actually go down that path, and the, most cases, the end users, they don't even notice it. Now, from the security standpoint, there is really um, the challenge of how can we keep control of all those applications, um, all those use cases that, that end users want to leverage these days. And you might have heard about cloud access security brokers. It's also kind of a, a toolkit or a technology that has popped up quite recently. Um, but it really is a, is a technology that helps us to stay under control when we leverage SaaS applications. So when we look here, kind of this SaaS cloud security journey from, from left to right, at first, you want to make sure that, that you protect your users um, from any threats, so block them to, to access any malicious sites out there. So kind of really make sure that only um, the good things are being accessed. But then also you need further control outside of just kind of black and white, good or bad. For example, you want to understand what actually are the, the applications that are being used by your end users. You want to understand how many applications um, are out there that are um, used on a regular basis. Is it really 1,200 for your application or is it even more? So this gives you then an insight into what are the, the applications that actually provide business or enterprise level um, uh, performance or security or compliance, and hence gives you visibility into where you probably should act and uh, invest into establishing some policies. And then what we see here, the third and the fourth use case is really then um, to imply further policies that you could say, I want to allow my users to, to use Office 365. Obviously, that's kind of their main tool these days to, to use in their business. Um, they, wanna, they should be able to download from OneDrive or share stuff with SharePoint. But you might want to be a little bit restrictive into what actually should be allowed. So you might want to make sure that there is no data, uh, internal data being sent to any private email address or you may want to restrict download of sensitive content to, to mobile devices that are not under the control of IT, IT um, departments. So there's plenty of use cases here that we can leverage and that we should think about when we want to enable our workforce to go down the SaaS path. They'll do it anyways, but the question is, how can we stay under control as, as an IT department? So in this case, we've seen it's a different use case than um, infrastructure as a service. It's really like applications that we all are used to access as, as easily as just downloading an app or entering a URL in our browser. But from an IT security perspective, from a governance perspective, there is a lot of challenges that need to be looked at. And um, we at Open Systems try to, to support our customers in that journey to um, enable the business, but still stay under control. The last use case here is really 
on the security side of things and really then about how we can detect and respond to advanced persistent threats. It's also a big topic in everybody's mouth. We all know it's not a question of the if, but it's rather a question of when we are being breached and when we have a security um, attack. So the question is, how can we best detect and respond to those? What is interesting here is a recent um, uh, survey showed that it often is not necessarily a problem of lack of security products but it's really a problem of how it's being managed. So as you see here, most of these companies, they've had a very good security stack in place, but the problem is that they were simply overwhelmed in managing it, and monitoring it. And that's been really the traditional challenge with, um, with security these days. There's tons of technologies, tons of different products and vendors out there and eventually all of these, they generate log information, they generate alerts, they generate spam, so to say. And it's really the IT security um, uh, the role to figure out where is the needle in the haystack. So there's too many disconnects, it's a lack of automation. And in the end, we all know there's a, a severe shortage in skills, uh, talent gap there that can help us attack this problem. And that's another kind of strong pillar of um, open systems product portfolio where we kind of provide a managed detection and response platform that really takes our customers on a journey throughout um, yeah, this problem set. When we look on, on the left side, there is a, a multitude of sources that we leverage to, um, to feed into this manage or this MDR platform. Um, some of them are a necessity so if you, for example, want to have firewall log information, you want to have um, network detection and response information, but maybe others like identity management or DNS information is, is a benefit. And, um, obviously, it provides very valuable context information, but it's just kind of the more complete it is, the better um, analysis, analysis you get out of it. So when we put all this information into the funnel and kind of start um, correlating and parsing and do the, the entire analysis, that's where, where the, the core competency of our service and our teams come in and where we really then collaborate with, um, with you and, and your people to figure out what are the critical um, threats, the critical events that need to be investigated in more detail. And eventually, if there is a breach or if we've seen that there was a positive threat, that we can respond to that as quickly as possible. There's plenty of products and solutions out there, but um, open systems coming as a strong security managed service provider for, for many, many years, we really want to build a service here that, that makes our customers happy. And that's where we said, okay, we need to, to use or leverage technology. Um, it cannot be built. Um, from scratch by everybody. And that's where, where Azure Sentinel um, came on board for us that really provides this great benefit in that, that correlation and that um, deep insight into, into what the threat landscape looks like these days. So we're building, or the MDR service is built completely on, on Azure Sentinel, meaning we have no infrastructure costs for us, but obviously most importantly for the customers. There is no limit on compute and storage resources, but we can really focus on to get, or to get as much output as needed for, um, yeah, to, to make that service uh, compelling and eventually bring, bring the output that the security teams need. So this use case shows that while we can do as much as we need on the protection side, uh, make sure that all access stays secure and data is sec secure, we all know that we will get breached at some point, and that's where we need to be able to detect and respond to those threats as quickly as possible. As a conclusion, we've seen that pretty much every Microsoft-centric environment is a multi-cloud environment. No matter if you use different SaaS applications from Microsoft, like Office 365, Microsoft Teams, Azure AD, or whatever else it is, 
or if you simply use infrastructure or platform as a service, pretty much every company these days comes comes in touch with either of these cases and will hence be faced with the, the challenges that we just looked at in our um, use cases. So with the rise of this hybrid or multi-cloud adoption, it just gets more and more challenging to not only find the best possible connection from your users um, to the cloud, but you also have to ensure that the endpoints and the data stays as secure as possible. And that's really where SASE comes into play that unifies the network and security solutions delivered as a holistic service. Fantastic, thank you, Savan. A um, couple questions here from the audience, and while we take those, I'm gonna throw up another poll here if I can. Uh, here we go, polls up. Um, okay, so uh, this is not an, any one specific question, but I'm combining a couple here. I kind of got the sense mm -hmm. from the questions that are coming in that um, when we're talking about SASE, there's a lot here, and people are kind of wondering, can, do you have to do this all at once, um, or is it possible to take a little bit more gradual approach to start adopting pieces of this at a time? Yeah, that's a, a very good question, because in the end, this SASE is, is nothing really new in, in the market space. It's a new name, it's a new category by Gartner, but in the end, it's a combination of different services, different solutions that have been out in the market for quite a while. And we absolutely um, understand that customers, it's too overwhelming to just do everything at once, and it definitely is, is not needed. So the best is to think about what are your biggest challenges these days and start there. You could approach this from the security side of things and say, I want to have more control over my stuff first and, and then think about connectivity. But in the most situation with most of our customers, we see that the connectivity side of things is the more prominent way to start with. Um, customers that migrate to open uh, to, to Office 365 or start having um, Azure deployments and they realize that their traditional LAN environment is not able to keep up with that. Or end users that, that complain because their performance in the office is even worse than, than at home all these kind of things. And that's where, where the IT department is really challenged these days to, to um, not do everything at once, but to really string, think strategically of what technology and what providers are out there to help them on this journey. I think you kind of started to touch on this, but um, another kind of theme that I'm seeing here in the questions is where do we start? Um, there's again, a, a lot of angles you could take here. Do you have any advice you could share with us before you go about just how to dig in and start getting some traction here? Yeah, so, I mean, we're always happy to, to talk to, to people that, that are struggling here with where to start. Um, eventually, it really boils down to figuring out um, where are you, what's your environment today? Because in the end, if you're a startup and you start from scratch, it's, it's very easy. You just move everything to the cloud. There's plenty of providers that, that do very good there. But we mostly work with large enterprises, with multinational corporations, and they never start on a green field. So right. we always have to start um, analyzing what does the existing network look like, like what, what applications are in place, what's the traffic flow, where do you have your bottlenecks? What's your constraints time-wise, time budget-wise? Maybe you have other provider contracts that are coming up for renewal. All these kind of things have to be taken into account. And based on where you are at in, uh, in that cloud journey, we can then um, support you in, in attacking things um, step by step. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much to Sylvan and Open Systems for being on the Ecocast today. Appreciate it. Thanks uh, for having us. Yeah, hey, appreciate it. Um, next up, uh, Jared and Thomas from SolarWinds are here. Guys, uh, are you in the call? Yes, sir. Yes. Awesome. Welcome. Excited to have you guys on. Go ahead and take it away. All right. Thank you. Uh, first off, let's see. I I'm Jared Hensel. I'm a product marketing manager here at SolarWinds. Uh, I've been in IT for, God knows, 15, 20 years now, uh, and I'm on predominantly all the anything systems related here, so Microsoft is right in our wheelhouse. 
Uh, and I've got Tom here. Yes, Tom is here. Uh, take it slow wind. And uh, we're here today to talk a little bit about some of our products and how to help you with your Microsoft-centric environment. Cool. Yeah, uh, you know, what we're going to present is the IT operations management uh, for Microsoft and Azure environments. So what I want to do is throw up a couple stats at you guys real quick and just bounce some things off you. Um, you know, $183 billion, that is the worldwide uh, public cloud spend um, as of 2018. You know, this is growing at 28%. So we know a large portion of this is Microsoft, but basically workload shifting, services shifting. Um, so really, you know, it, why monitoring your things? The, the modern data center is transforming. It's no longer things in your basement. They're everywhere in particular cloud, but still on premises. But there's a huge spend on that. So that's why we feel SolarWinds is uniquely positioned to monitor things anywhere and everywhere. Um, you know, the 24% was, that was, um, how much companies are going to spend on the cloud in the next coming year, 20% more uh, on public cloud services. So again, you know, where we find ourselves unique is that we can monitor things on premises and in the cloud. We don't like people and individuals and in IT departments having Microsoft things on prem that they could touch and feel and manipulate. They put it in the cloud and then they disappear into the ether. Uh, the 52% is basically the percent of uh, Azure adoption while well, everybody talks about AWS. Azure is growing, obviously Microsoft is growing leaps and bounds. Um, the 50% was a Gartner statistic saying um, that how much they are going to uh, increase their IT infrastructure monitoring in the prior year. Um, and then the 53%, that is a percentage that we ran on ourselves. We did a customer survey and we had 53% of our customers adopting Azure uh, as their cloud provider to uh, you know, move services and applications to. So we feel that you know Microsoft is getting its lion's share of uh, attention and, and dollars and, and infrastructure spending. So you, you can't just move your things and have them disappear into the ether. You know, obviously, as consumers move to the cloud, you need unique solutions that can help you do that. It is a different skill set. So uh, you know, what how you monitored applications and operating systems on premises is slightly different how you monitor them in the cloud. So we've seen uh, increased IT complexity, um, lack of control that you put things in the cloud and uh, you don't have the knobs and dials you can continue to turn um, that you did on premises, but you still need to have the ability to have insights into what's going on, a uh, security posture, anything along those lines. Um, and really uh, talking to individuals, putting things in the cloud just kind of, again, it's a unique skill set and so, we need our software to help us build, bridge that gap that when we put things somewhere that they just don't disappear. Um, and then you can have compliance issues and ensuring that, hey, you know, I put things there, there I do have control uh, issues that I can't, you know, gap my, um, my data the way it once was. Um, and then just inefficiencies associated with managing cloud providers as a whole. Um, you know, so it, it, is, it is unique. Tom, did you have something to, uh, to join in with? Well, I, I did want to mention when I read this slide earlier that I think the one thing that's missing there is one of the challenges would be cost. A lot of times people have migrated their workloads uh, up to Azure or AWS, and the cost may not be in line with what their expectations were, especially considering the performance they're getting. So I would always add that in as a, as a challenge uh, when people do move to the cloud. Yeah, a, a great point. I mean, there is, you know, uh, SolarWinds has a couple tools on helping you monitor those costs, but then also the ability to monitor performance before, during, and after a migration. So again, you could put that cost into context. If um, if your performance is relatively flat, does your cost justify the benefits for being in Azure, uh, you know, being in a secure location, or I was expecting performance increases or more transactions or more availability or whatever it is, um, my cost does not, you know, associate with that. Again, that's something that you can go back and, and realize. So, again, you know, SolarWinds, we have got, you know, multiple ways or in multiple ways we try to break up this hybrid IT uh, system on how we monitor and where we monitor. And this is kind of a riff on the Gartner ITOM chart where we've kind of created our own version 
uh, and how we categorize our products. Obviously, we've got the application management and performance across physical uh, and cloud resources. We have uh, a database um, performance across physical and cloud resources. Um, and actually, Tom hit me up before this that um, we just had an acquisition that actually I should have extended this bar chart all the way through SAS. So that that's my bad that I didn't update this the last week. Um, yes, yeah, shame then, on you. Yeah, shame on me. We it, it just I, too many things. Uh, <laughs> and then we've got our server management, our our typical infrastructure. Um, you know, but one thing that I find is unique with the micro, Microsoft and, and really anything is the connectivity to those services wherever they are. Connectivity between your servers, regardless of Microsoft or Linux or anything along those lines. So, you know, how are we solving this problem is, you know, we've got multiple products, but the three I kind of want to focus on quickly is our server and application monitor, where obviously it does exactly what the name says, is that, you know, we're going to be able to discover your servers, uh, regardless of their operating system type, regardless of physical or virtual. Um, and then we're going to basically start saying, hey, these are the applications that are associated with these servers. Um, and these are the connectivity. These servers are talking to one another. These servers are not talking. Um, you know, and this could be on-premises, virtualized, physical. They can be cloud, Azure, AWS. Um, and really what's powerful is the creating the template. So to know that you have a server um, is, is great, but what, do you, what is on that server? It's just not, it, it's there for a purpose. Um, and you have the ability to deploy templates that are customizable to uh, your environment. Yeah, uh, I want to add something about those templates. It's also uh, what's not mentioned on this screen is the strength of our community. So a lot of these templates have been offered up by members of our community, our customers who have uh, shared their knowledge with other customers. And a lot of times those templates or parts of those templates end up getting embedded into the product. And that's why you know, we, have, we say we have support for over 1200 enterprise applications. The real strength of SAM is what you get in the templates and in the community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we we create a bunch of out of the box templates, um, but again, there is no one size fits all. So between the customization of those and the community, uh, you do have that ability to get that nice snug fit of uh, application monitoring. Um, the next product is database performance analyzer. Again, this is what we're focusing on here is obviously the Microsoft SQL, but we can do Oracle and different databases there. Um, but what's really powerful and sets this apart is, you know, we have machine learning in there for anomaly detection. So we can tell you when things are not running the way they are expecting to run. Um, you know, and we, and we give you details into what is going on inside your database, what queries are running the most, what is their wait time, giving you a different lens on your database and its performance as opposed to saying, yeah, I, I see a SQL server, um, it has 99% memory usage. Well, that's a SQL server, so go figure. Um, but giving you a different insight on how to optimize and, and tune that database performance, in particular for SQL server. Agreed. Uh, I'll set aside your flippant comment about SQL server and memory usage for now. We can come back <laughs> to that later. But uh, the thing about DP is that it gives you insight into the engine itself and the database engine is often a mystery for a lot of users and administrators having the ability to see what queries are running what they're waiting for the server health tied to a database query uh, even in the case of dpa to give you metrics related to virtualization on top of that you get that layered that stacked view so you can really see where is the root cause of the problem that might or might not be happening right now uh, absolutely. I, I actually was a former SolarWinds customer, and the last product I bought before joining SolarWinds was DPA because I was the uh, accidental admin that basically did the next, next, next strategy of deploying it and saying, hey, I don't know, it's it's not me anymore. Um, and that DPA definitely saved my bacon on getting into the database and finding the, the query that was driving this, well, in my case, a website performance issue, but it was drilling, uh, you know, uh, all the way into the database. Um, and then finally, I want to talk about network performance monitor. And you're, and you're kind of probably like, uh, Microsoft-centric, this is networking, uh, I, I don't get it. Um, 
you know, where we want to, uh, the highlight of this is obviously it's got massive strengths on just network monitoring, Cisco and all that stuff, but really as people are moving workloads, or even if you have Office A and Office B, how you get to those offices and how your data is passed is just, a, it's, it's important. The end users don't care that you've got your data center in Tacoma, Washington, and one in Miami. They just expect it to work. I'm well aware that that's whatever, 5,000 miles between the two locations, and you have to go through numerous telco providers to get there, or Office 365, any of these things. So having the ability to at least get insights into how your traffic is flowing um, and how your services are reacting to that traffic is, is very powerful. So with that said, I'm going to get us into the demo and share my screen. Give it a second. I yeah, I can see it. Perfect. Perfect. So, awesome. So here is the Orion's summary dashboard. And, and again, all these products are on a single platform called Orion. This gives you a shared UI, shared permissions, alerting, reporting, all these things. So it's very powerful in the sense that you don't have to set up things 500 times. You could have different disciplines, networking people working in similar interfaces and reports as systems people, as database people, and storage people, and cloud people. Um, that you're all in here and you can all talk the same language and show the same things. So I'm going to quickly go and obviously start with our server and application monitor. Um, so if I come over here, this is what we're going to do is tier our applications. Again, we find it valuable that, you know, this is how an end user is speaking. Hey, I see, and they, they're probably not saying Active Directory. They're probably saying, hey, I have login issues or I have email issues. They're not saying server XYZ has got an issue. So we're kind of lumping them by the applications, which hopefully you find advantageous in, in drilling into what the, the user is saying is going on or what you're trying to tune. So, you know, I'm going to just choo choose this app insight for Active Directory and, and go into this particular server. So we've got a couple things. We've got the actual server itself. I'm going to open that in a new window and the actual Active Directory template. So. The server itself is going to give me the standard metrics that you would see, uptime, CPU, RAM, um, any type of alerts that are going on on here, its availability, um, you, know, what it, you know, what it looks like at last reboot, if I need to, uh, what kind of patching, anything on there. What you'll also notice, though, is I see this connectivity. So Sam has got this ability to show your connection, so I actually can show this Active Directory server is talking to this uh, cache server, and I can actually drill into this. So even from a systems point of view, I'm getting, I would call this network insights of what is um, going on. So I can actually see I've got, you know, an Active Directory talking between these two servers. I happen to know this is a server, one's on-premises and one is in Azure. So well, I see 46 milliseconds. In my case, I know that's actually pretty decent for the distance I'm traveling. But obviously, if I was just rack one, rack two, I'd probably start engaging the network person immediately going, why am I seeing some crazy uh, packet loss or latency between these two? But jumping back over here. Here again, though, you'll see all your services and processes, anything like that. I can scroll all the way down and get into, scroll down. Uh, I can see IP addresses, CPU forecasting when I think things are going to run out, when, you know, where my trends are. So obviously I can see, hey, I'm actually using less memory over time, so that's not too terrible. I can see my drive space, applications. And again, I can come down here and start seeing those templates that we alluded to earlier. I've already got the Active Directory one loaded over here. So again, I am now looking at specific metrics on Active Directory. I'm looking at replication, so I can get in here and see you know, how things are replicating. I can see my roles. Again, I can see that pretty much we have seven servers with no roles. This is you know, demo data, so we didn't really set it up too crazy, but I can see that this e-server has got all these roles on there. I can start seeing things in the event logs or uh, you know, anything that's getting locked or inactive logins, things like that. So again, this gives you the ability to see all the processes and services that we are saying, hey, these are mission critical to make Active Directory function. These are, uh, you know, if these are not running, your Active Directory is not going to be working, not going to be uh, syncing anything along those lines. So let me 
go back over here. So again, we have, as Tom alluded to, we have a whole bunch of templates out of the box, but we have the ability to manage those templates or create custom templates. So if I come over here, I can actually see right now, these are all my templates I have deployed. A lot of these are Microsoft, but I come over here and I can see in this particular version, I've got 310 templates uh, out of the box. And I can, I've got them, there's some groupings over here and I could scroll down and I can find Microsoft's over here somewhere. Where are we? So I've got Microsoft and I can see that I've got 65 templates in this Microsoft one. But if I also scroll down, I'll find that I've got a, a Windows one. So again, I can come in here and look at all the templates that are categorized as Windows. I can come in here, I can say, oh, I've got a, a, literally a Windows template server 2019. I can come in here and see all the processes and services that make up that template. You have the ability to add more if you want to. The, we're, obviously, these are our uh, attempts to say, hey, this is what you need to monitor, but we know everybody's environment is unique uh, and that you have the ability to add certain components to this template. You even have the ability to customize your alerting on here. So you can say, hey, I want this to be, uh, this box has to run ultra lean, so I'm gonna change my warning threshold to be 20% or 80, whatever it is. You have the ability to customize it. Uh, you also have the ability to do dynamic baselining. So you can say, hey, I want to look at this particular time, this server, this application are working great. I want that to be my standard and deviate from there. So if it's 60%, then that's what it's gonna use. So when it hits 70, you're gonna get alerted. So you do have great flexibility into adding and customizing the services um, that you want to monitor in these templates. You also have the ability, if you don't want to, go back over here to this one, um, if you don't want to add things into templates, you just want to do one-off process monitoring. When you're on the server, you can come in here and hit Process Explorer, and now I can see all the processes on there. I can come in here, select it, end it, or start monitoring it. So again, you don't, you don't even have to create templates if you want to get to this type of customization. Obviously, doing this, you're not going to be able to rapidly deploy, you know, you're not going to be able to create a template and deploy it to 100 servers. These are, this is one off, but it does give you that flexibility to monitor those things. Um, so what I'd like to show is where once you've started creating these templates and started grouping servers, uh, in this particular thing, we basically created one called our web front in our Azure. So I've got a bunch of servers here in Azure. Uh, I've linked them together and then I've got my back end on premises so I can actually see that I've got issues with this particular SQL server. So again, I can just quickly start drilling into there and start seeing what's going on. Hopefully, I'm not seeing this for the first time. I, I should have gotten an email. I can create alerts saying, hey, alert me when this happens. Uh, you know, Let me know when something's going awry. So again, I'm gonna start at the basic level, start looking at the CPU and RAM. Uh, in this particular server, I know we're throwing an error just because we have, um, it's at 90% usage. But if I didn't, if I, if I remove that, I can actually drill into actually the SQL portion itself and start looking at what is actually going on within SQL Server. Again, now I'm going to see all my databases. And this was, I, I just deployed this template saying, hey, this is a SQL Server. Here's the SQL template. Go. All this is going to start populating back for me. Show me my buffer. Show me my cache. Show me my SQL errors. Again, my processes. Anything along those lines. But where SolarWinds is powerful is that we've got the ability to have these products start interacting. So as I alluded to in the slides, we've got a product called Database Performance Analyzer. And this data right here is actually being pulled into the server product by DPA. So I actually can start drilling into particular queries and start seeing what's going on there. And I could easily just quick this. And now I'm actually inside of uh, DPA, which is Tom's wheelhouse. So again, it is. Have, what? Go ahead. Sorry, Tom. No, I was just going to say it truly is. But uh, uh, <laughs> well, I think you wanted to mention there was that there's an integration piece between the Orion platform and DPA as well, and that's how we're getting all this goodness to show up. But it's just a couple of clicks away, and then you get over into the DPA product itself. Uh, the bar charts tell you uh, the story, right? Big bar usually means bad, but depends on what the Access shows me this says it's in terms of minutes, so you know may or may not be something to investigate. On the right hand side, it shows me the weights involved. Uh, I get some query advisors, uh, what we call our intelligent analysis down below, 
uh, table tuning advisors. There happens to be nothing there for that one. Some basic statistics, information about the plans. It's, it, maybe it's had multiple plans over this uh, rolling period. Uh, lots of good diagnostic information for an administrator, developer, for anyone really to kind of take a, a deeper dive to figure out what steps might they take next in order to solve the problem. Yeah. No, what, what I find is really powerful, again, coming from a accidental admin point of view, is, you know, where DPA really shines, and this is a newer feature in there, is the anomaly detection. So yep. this chart down here is telling you when something did not run or is running according to plan. So, I, I mean, this is, hey, red big bar, bar here, so I can quickly drill into this and start seeing when things did not run according to plan. Because um, I know myself, being a former administrator, Tom, everybody, you know, we have other things we need to be doing. And so half the time, I, I is alert me when something's not working well or not working differently. You know, that's going to quickly highlight, hey, this was not, we don't expect this to run the wait time to be this long at 9 a.m. Um, these queries here, this one, wait time, this is normal. Hey, uh, this is the way you always work. Everything's working according to plan. I can go get lunch. I can go do something else, some other task. But at this point in time, I, I would not expect an end user to call me and say, hey, the accounting system is running slow or so, or at least slow and I have to troubleshoot it as a database issue. Yeah. Uh, the key thing I like to mention here is how this is a, this is different than just uh, alerting against a baseline. Oftentimes with man, uh, monitoring tools, what you have is a tool just sort of takes a baseline and says, okay, I, you know, my CPU should be 80% uh, for this particular server maybe. And then when something goes over that threshold, then you get the alert. That's kind of just rules-based alerting. It's not real, say, artificial intelligence, right? So what we have here is we have anomaly detection it's actual machine learning. There's real math under the hood here. It's filtering out for seasonality. So daily, weekly, monthly spikes that you see, maybe we know, recognize that backups happen every night at 2 a.m., for example. So we could filter out the seasonalities. Then we build a prediction and we say, all right, we predict we should have this amount of weight for this particular day. Then we score ourselves against that prediction. And so the model is constantly updating itself, trying to get better. And what you see at the bottom is, I mean, that's your signal through the noise. So up above where we used to just have those bars, how would you know which one bar might have been more critical than the other? You, you kind of don't. Maybe 9 a.m. because it's the biggest, but 10 a.m. might have been actually something worse. So the one below with the anomaly detection, now I know where is that signal? throughout the whole day, where do I really need to focus? And it's it's a powerful addition to what was already a powerful tool. No, absolutely, because I mean, while, while I don't see any anomalies between two and 10, it doesn't mean that there are opportunities to improve this database. Um, you know, that, that, um, that, you know, there are things that can still be optimized, but this is how it's always been running. So again, if you're, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You can take that mindset, or you can still tune and, and tweak to get this to run better. But definitely, at this point in time, there probably is something broke, or something's not working according to plan. So I completely agree with Tom that this is really showing you that signal through the noise, so that you can focus on something and not start your troubleshooting blind and, and not know where you're going. So the final piece I wanted to show was, ironically enough, the networking side of the house. So you know, in this example I had over here where I had um, I had half my stuff on premises, half my stuff in the cloud, that's great and all, but again, I know that this is spanning hundreds if not thousands of miles for this caching server, this SharePoint server to put data into this SQL server. Um, so I do need to be accountable to some degree of, of what's going on. So again, if I come over here and just go to network and our net path, this is just going to show the pathing in this particular case. I'll pull up either Azure SQL or let's just do Office 365. It shows me from point A to point B all through the telco providers, through Charter, through another Charter, and actually into Microsoft. So I can quickly start seeing, hey, I don't have a communication issue here. At this point, if I have issues, I know it's on me, the systems administrator. I can't throw the network admin or somebody else under the bus. So 
with that said, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Hopefully, we'll get kicked back over to the slides. Let it go. And get over to Q&A. Um, trying to see if I can see where they're at. The I'm looking over what's there now. It looks like a lot of it is probably a little more in the weeds than would be useful for the, the greater okay. good of the group. Um, but I notice you guys have some uh, extra stuff to share with people. Um, looks like maybe on the next slide, maybe we could talk through that. And then also, um, I wasn't sure if Thomas wanted to take a minute to uh, get back at you about that uh, SQL jab, because I know he's very sensitive about SQL. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, this was just where people can go learn about more of our products. Obviously, we've got, uh, you can go look at we, uh, the SolarWinds SAM and the uh, Server and Application Monitor and DPA. We've got, a, you know, application performance optimization. Obviously, between the two, we feel like we can get the infrastructure, the application, and the queries all optimized and tuned for you. Uh, we've got, you know, the whole suite of products, which would extend to, obviously, the networking side of the house and some storage side of the house. Um, and then we've got links to just Azure specific stuff. I mean, all of our products are available in the Azure marketplace. We are Azure certified. Um, so that took a, a little bit of time to get worked out with Microsoft. But so, I mean, if you are in the process of moving from on-premises to the cloud and want to use Azure, by all means, we can be deployed quickly through the marketplace and monitor things within Azure, outside of Azure, back on-premises. We've had plenty of people shift their data center from an on-premise driven to a cloud driven. Um, and then, I used our online demo, oriondemo.solarwinds.com. That is where I was toying around and clicking through. So again, if you want to just go in there and click some buttons and see what's going on, um, you're more than welcome to do that. And uh, you know, now I can let Tom lecture me on SQL memory <laughs> usage. I'm not going to lecture you much. That's much. pretty cool. So if you had technical questions um, and want to just poke at it a little bit, looks like that online demo might be a great way to go. Yeah, I mean, that, that has Thomas. all our... Sorry. Go ahead. Talk, talk I about it. No. <laughs> I was going to say that's all of our products on there. I mean, it's kind of the just top-down driven. You'll see basically we'll give you an application that SAM, networking, database. It'll take you kind of right to the product we were just talking about or products we were talking about. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you guys so much for being on the Ecocast today. We appreciate you joining us. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, and we're going to transition on to the final presenter of today's EcoCast. But uh, by way of transition, I want to ask uh, another follow-up question and give away a gift card. So uh, the next gift card is going to go to Jolene Wells from New Hampshire. Congratulations, Jolene. We'll be reaching out to you via email after the event to get that delivered. I'm going to give just one more minute here on the poll question. Um, this one is just about if there's anything else SolarWinds can follow up with you on to help you get questions answered and learn more about that solution, if that was interesting to you at all. And finally, we're going to move on to hear from Mike McGee at Nutanix. Mike, are you on the line? Uh, I'm on. How's everyone doing? Awesome. Welcome, Mike. Thank you for joining us today. We're excited to hear from you, so go ahead and take it away. No, I, uh, I appreciate it. Um, so my name is Mike McGee. I'm a technical marketing engineer with Nutanix. And uh, as a part of our, our brief discussion today, I'm going to talk about where Microsoft technologies start to intersect with what we do at Nutanix. That's going to include anything you might be doing on premises. So any applications you might be installing in, in virtualization uh, layers, et cetera, but also where we work with Microsoft Azure and also multi cloud environments. If you are not familiar with Nutanix, we essentially help you modernize your data center. So think any application, it could be end user computing, it could be large scale enterprise applications at any scale. So if you're running applications on the edge in remote office or branch offices or even centralized data centers uh, or anywhere really in, in any cloud, whether it's a private, private cloud, hybrid cloud, um, or even a full public cloud. And we do this all based on software. We do it by combining multiple layers within the traditional IT environment. 
if you are familiar with Nutanix, we are historically associated with hyperconverged infrastructure or HCI. So we'll, we'll spend a little time focusing on that because when you're on-premises, private, or maybe hybrid cloud, uh, you're likely virtualizing applications and running it on a consolidated platform. Uh, but there's also pieces around how do I orchestrate that governance around my applications or maybe a platform as a service or even software as a service, and how do I run that in a hybrid cloud or even just a, a wholly uh, public cloud environment. Um, so we'll get into a lot of those details on how Nutanix can help you up the stack with those kinds of use cases around end user computing, database as a service, as well as a core uh, infrastructure as a service as a part of your private or hybrid cloud. To focus briefly on hyperconverged infrastructure or HCI, and, and really what you're going to hear as a theme throughout our discussion is Nutanix's ability to give you to give you choice. Uh, so when it comes to HCI, we support really any core platform uh, from a hardware perspective. But because we're really a software company, uh, we, we're really independent and offer you full choice across hypervisors as well. So if you're not fully familiar with HCI, it's really where you take otherwise disparate pieces within a data center, the core servers, which include your compute, your storage network, your storage systems, and even your virtualization layer and combine it into one simple to deploy stack. Um, that adds a lot of benefits and agility to your core data center, your ability to quickly deploy applications. Uh, and based on our really our, the freedom of choose that we give you, you can choose any hypervisor. Um, so we support VMware ESXi, a lot of environments that are Microsoft centric will, will utilize Hyper-V, we have support across 2012 all the way through 2019, which is due uh, very soon. And we also have our, our own virtualization option called, called AHV, which we've qualified with Microsoft environments. We've gone through the, uh, the server virtualization validation program or SVVP, qualified drivers, HCL, et cetera. So you have confidence that you can run Windows in the, as an operating system and all the related applications, whether you're still running Exchange on-prem, SQL Server, SharePoint, Dynamics, uh, et cetera. Um, so consolidating a platform with, with HCI is really one of the, the core and primary tenants that Nutanix gives you to run your Microsoft applications. But ultimately, when you start looking at where IT is heading or where it really is already, uh, you, you need to enable certain tenants in, in order to really fulfill the mission as an, as an infrastructure administrator or, or IT administrator. Uh, at, at its heart, along with simplifying based on HCI, you need to start standardizing moving up the stack across your applications. How do I consistently deploy a multi-tiered application and how do I do it the same on-prem or, or in the cloud? What are ways in which I can do that? And not only deployment, how do I manage it over time? How do I do scale? How do I do upgrades? How do I decommission or how do I move? Another piece is once you've made choices on how to deploy your applications, how do I optimize for performance, for cost? Should I deploy this on-premises? Should I deploy it in the cloud? If I did deploy it in the cloud, how are, those, how are those resources being utilized? How can I ensure that they're performant? How can I ensure that they're secure? And how can I optimize for cost? And if I do need to move it, what's the best option? Or even to, or even to change subscription models, when's the best time to do that based on perhaps on-demand resources versus reserved subscriptions? And lastly, and I think to agree most importantly, how do you make it self-service? How do you empower your end users to do these kinds of operations? How do you get show back and charge back? And how do you allow, allow them in the era of cloud to actually do these deployments themselves uh, in, a, in a modern and governed way? So that's really what we're going to focus on above that core HCI stack or even completely running within a public cloud. How does Nutanix then help you with that application orchestration and multi-cloud ma management across those three areas that we just focused on? So we're going to focus on some, some core uh, use cases across uh, four core products that not only tie into Azure, but start tying directly into specific applications like, like SQL Server and, and database as a service. So to start with something that we call Nutanix.com, from the perspective of application automation, uh, automation and, and deployment, as well as, uh, as well as governance, that's really where COM comes into play. It gives you an application agnostic method for essentially creating blueprints within a given environment to deploy an application that you can then publish via a marketplace to your end users. So out of the gate, it gives you self-service capabilities to any of the tenants that might want to run or deploy a given application. 
It also gives you governance because you can now define a blueprint exactly the way an application is going to be deployed, uh, how it's secured, uh, et cetera, and publish that to a marketplace so you have a very standardized method by which your end users can, can do deployments. And as I mentioned, beyond deployments, Com can give you full application lifecycle management. So from initial deployment to adding scale to that environment to performing upgrades, uh, also down to decommissioning. De 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 so it's not just uh, you know, the day one operations, it's also operations down the line. And again, standardizing those operations to make sure that they're simple, secure, and something that your end users can perform. And lastly, Com really helps you also manage a multi-cloud environment. Um, you can use Com to deploy applications onto Nutanix HCI, but with the exact same blueprint and even through the same marketplace item, you can choose on where to deploy it. So you can select to deploy in, in Microsoft Azure, for example. So it is through the marketplace where you would publish your blueprints, assign them to, get, to different users, and then allow a given blueprint to, to be deployed or not be deployed you know, based on based on cost or based on other requirements within your business. So if you want to choose a given maybe multi-tiered application re relying on Microsoft SQL Server, you want some of those virtual machines to be running on premises, maybe other parts of that application could be running in the cloud, you can create a blueprint to do that style of deployment in a hybrid fashion all the way down to allowing your end users to, to actually do that, that level of, uh, of deployment scale and management over time. The blueprints are, are really just a way for you to define an application. Uh, what are the virtual machines associated with it? What are their dependencies? If you do a scale operation, what else do you need to do within a, within a given environment? So it's a very simple uh, GUI-based platform and framework to allow you to start to build these out. And these could be done by an application administrator, uh, you know, maybe, maybe by an end user, or even it's so simple by an infrastructure administrator. So very simple way to create policies and standards for deploying these applications directly to a marketplace for, for your end, end users. And, and really at the end, it's about governance and consistency of these applications. And once you do define these blueprints, we really give you choice. So we talked about hypervisor choice uh, earlier, or even hardware choice as you deploy our core uh, AOS software. But you can also choose when it comes to COM where those deployments occur. So whether it's in our native iCloud services, AWS, or you know, Microsoft-centric environments are really going to be focusing on using Azure and their Azure credits, you can choose where, once you create these deployments, these standardized blueprints, where you want them deployed. Um, it can be in the cloud or it can be on-prem, whether it's virtual machine-based or even container-based. So COM is really that application agnostic method, really any application at any scale. You build out your blueprints and away you go. Choose where to deploy based on cost publish that to your end users. But you can also get into more specific use cases. So think of virtual desktops, VDI, or end user computing. Um, a lot of solutions out there that we support as a part of our core HCI platform or part of the hypervisors that we support with ESX or AHV or Hyper-D, you have uh, qualified solutions with Citrix, with VMware Horizon, with Microsoft-based VDI solutions. All those can run on our platform across our hypervisors and we have solutions and qualifications and integrations uh, with those styles of solutions uh, across the board. But we do also offer a, a native service for end user computing in BDI. It's something that we call Zyframe and it's also something that you can deploy and leverage within Microsoft Azure. And essentially what Frame is, is a, a cloud based cloud-based platform, software as a service uh, that you can run really anywhere that gives you the ability to es essentially run a virtual desktop and end user computing instance in the cloud with a, with a browser-based uh, solution. So enabling really any device, you can really use your browser on any device, tablet, laptop, phone, et cetera. So imagine having a, a cloud-based VDI solution that you can really run anywhere with any device that you choose. So there's really no agent required with Frame. Again, just HTML5 based browsers, which are supported just about uh, with, with any vendor out there between Chrome, uh, Firefox, et cetera. Because it's cloud-based, you can really start to spin up resources in really a matter of minutes. Uh, you can also spin down. You can choose when you want to maybe scale up or scale down a given workload, et cetera. So lots of flexibility on the where and how and how much you want to consume, whether you need to scale or, or scale down. And again, it's really agnostic. 
So if you want to run in Azure, great. If you want to run on-premises, say on our Nutanix AHV platform, you can do that as well. And you can and mix and match and control exactly the way that you choose to utilize those resources. Again, really optimizing for cost and your business requirements. It's really as simple as logging into a centralized console, choosing your cloud where you want these instances to be, be deployed. So on-prem, Azure, AWS, et cetera. You have flexibility in the way you can authorize your users. Most are using some form of Active Directory, OTA, et cetera. You can then bring your own application images. So what are your desktop images? Are they Windows Server? Are they Windows 10? Are they some form of Linux, et cetera? You then can connect these operating systems to storage. If you want to leverage home profile directories, user directories, uh, et cetera, it could be OneDrive. Again, as a part of the Microsoft ecosystem, we also, as a part of our core platform, platform offer an application that we call Nutanix Files, which allows you to export our core storage out over the SMB or NFS protocol to applications, or in this case, perhaps over the SMB protocol to your end users. Uh, so if you're using an on-premises Nutanix cluster, you can actually use Nutanix files as the file and data solution for those individual desktops spun up within Zyframe. And again, because it's a browser-based solution, you could run it on your laptop, you can run it on your phone, you can run it on a tablet, et cetera. So really, again, going to that freedom of choice that we talked about before across applications, hypervisor, cloud, et cetera, Frame really has you covered in spades when it comes to that and user computing uh, style solution. Now, let's say you've deployed some applications. You maybe use Calm to deploy a, a, a multi-layer three-tiered application, or maybe you've done some deployments with iFrame that you have running in Microsoft Azure. The next piece is how do I start to monitor and optimize those specific solutions? Um, not only from a, a governance perspective, but also from a security side. And that's really where Zybeam comes into play. So regardless of where I'm running a given application, how do I ensure it's secure? And how do I ensure that it's optimized for, for cost and also for performance? And Zy really has you cover on, on both of those fronts. So we'll initially focus on it from a cost control. And it really falls into three main buckets. How do I get visibility? optimization, and also control. From the visibility perspective, Xi will allow you to register, for example, your Microsoft Azure Enterprise account. All the subscriptions to that account will show up within the dashboard, and you can start to understand where is the cost associated with this enterprise account or associated with this subscription occurring. So you get an overall spend overview across the different subscriptions, so you can find out who might be consuming the most within that enterprise account. You get a time-based spend analysis to understand where X amount was spent on a given month. Is it going up? Is it going down? And you also get a spend efficiency. So you can understand, are the resources I'm consuming actually being utilized, or can I start to find efficiencies within this given environment? Once you understand where the efficiencies can be, can be had, you then get to start to optimize. So do I need to reduce or, or scale down some of my resources because you know what, I'm really not using that Azure instance for, of SQL. Maybe the virtual machines I have running in Azure aren't consuming all their compute or all their storage, et cetera. Um, so not only can you start to optimize that manually, we can, we can also remediate some of these items for you. If you want to decommission some of the cloud-based instances that you have running across databases or, or virtualization, et cetera, you can start to get policy-driven automation to eliminate those resources uh, beyond the fact that you're going to have complete showback and chargeback to your end users. And one of the cooler, cooler things that we've been looking at with, with Beam around cost optimization is how do I manage how the kinds of subscriptions I would use within a given cloud vendor? You know, do I want to use reserved instances, which might be some of the more expensive side, or do I want to be more on demand or maybe even spot instances, which could be the, the cheapest, but you know, that might go away within a given time period. And how do I shift my licensing or really shift my resources between these as I go? Um, so Beam is going to help you understand that and help you with that shift 
uh, in the future so you can actually optimize without even moving the application specifically to these reserved or on-demand or spot instances as you go. So really giving you that, that cost optimiz optimization and automation that you just wouldn't be able to manage uh, without an application like Beam. And I also mentioned how Beam can help you with security and compliance within, within your multi-cloud environment, again, both on-premises as well as within, within Microsoft Azure. And similar to the cost optimization, it starts with detection and, and initial compliance. So you'll immediately see a complete heat map of all of the instances that you might have running around the world, uh, what, again, whether it's on-premises or across your different clouds. Uh, built in are over 500 security checks to help you audit a given environment and understand whether you're compliant to any baselines that you might have. You can certainly create your own customized security checks and add them to the system. Um, so it's very flexible to just to allow you to build out that environment. But the real the real benefit here uh, above above everything else is that you have consistency of how that security and those checks are being applied across clouds and even on premises with uh, Nutanix AHV. Once you do have some understanding of whether you are compliant with your security requirements, you can then start to do remediation. So there's one-click remediation capabilities, you know, whether it's uh, closing down certain instances that weren't supposed to be deployed, maybe networking ports, et cetera. We give you either the ability to, uh, to copy out or understand the way in which you can remediate a, a given security vulnerability or even automate that with some, some one-click capabilities across your various clouds. And you can also bundle these checks to create your own policies, but we also have built-in policies. So Azure CIS, for example, or, or HIPAA or PCI DSS. So we have built-in compliance and security baselines for your various clouds, again, like Azure, or if you're running applications on-premises with AHV, you have control over, say, you know, doing a SIG-based compliance. So am, am, I, am I compliant to my security technical implement implementation guide, you know, based on this hypervisor, so on and so forth. So complete security standardization, remediation, as well as uh, detection with uh, with Xi. Oh, with Xi Beam, excuse me. And lastly, just to focus a bit more on the on the application layer and our friends at SolarWinds who are presenting before focused on SQL Server quite a bit. Um, so why don't we also take a turn and focus on SQL Server, really database as a service, something that we call Nutanix Era. So with Nutanix Era, we give you, we give you four core capabilities when it comes to managing your databases. Again, just the idea of, of choice with Era, we give you the ability to manage uh, your provisioning of your databases across various vendors. So Microsoft SQL Server front and center, absolutely. But also if you have Oracle databases in your environment, MySQL, PostgreSQL, MariaDB, et cetera, others in the future, we give you a standardized database as a service platform for managing that, the various databases that you have within your estate. This includes one-click provisioning. And again, going back to our core tenants, self-service, you can, you can deploy blueprints at the database layer. So essentially a database uh, focus profile that you can publish to various tenants. It could be a, a DBA team, it could be an application automation team, a QA team, et cetera, to deploy databases based on Nutanix best practices on Nutanix HCI. Around this, we can do database protection because it's running on our platform. We can do space efficient snapshots for surgical repair or recovery. We can also leverage those snapshots for copy data management. So imagine standing up a brand new QA instance or development instance and always having it refresh with the latest production data. So you can always be testing with the same data set that once you deploy that code or if you need to test that code, it'll be the same information that were the same underlying uh, data set that you would have in production. Um, so you can use ERA for creating snapshots, automatically presenting them to test and dev instances, and then refreshing them on a schedule of your choice, either manually or based on an automated timeline that you can define. This is all based on a uh, technology that we call a, a time machine where you have a scheduled SLA and you can use any point in time within that SLA to recover the databases for tests or for data protection. And lastly, we've also had patching to, to Nutanix era. So you have the full ability to create these database application profiles 
you can create different versions of them. And as you need to patch a database, you can apply that versioned uh, database software to maybe older instances running in your environment. So again, going to that self-service and governance, you have standardization, you can have version control, kind of day two, day three operations, and you can also publish these for self-service to your end users. And again, this is based on our, our core HCI platform. Um, so our base infrastructure services with HCI, we give you the platform services around virtual machine deployment, the provisioning, the underlying copy data management mechanism that we use with our data protection and snapshots. But then Arrow really gives you that database as a service on top, again, across Microsoft SQL Server and other database estates, giving you that consistency. It's fully API driven. So going back to what we were talking about with Nutanix Com, Com could actually be the core engine to drive a multi-tiered application deployment, while at the same time calling ERA to maybe do a piece of that within, say, for example, deploying Microsoft SQL Server databases or refreshing a database as a part of a, of a, of a scale operation for a development environment. So really giving you the flexibility, the automation, uh, whether it's self-service through our own inter interface, uh, whether it's through, you know, third-party utilities that might do the provisioning for you via our APIs. So with that, hopefully that gives you an overview. Uh, and a lot of people associate Nutanix with just core HCI, but you can see we've grown uh, up the stack from there to really help you simplify application lifecycle management, optimize your environment with tools like uh, Zybeam, and also really add self-service to your end users really across our applications, whether it's with SciFrame and end-user computing, uh, whether it's with our database as a service with, with Nutanix era, et cetera. All right, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to, to the team for Q&A. Awesome, thanks, Mike. So um, yeah, a couple of questions here from the audience before you go. At the end there, you were talking about era, and there's one question that came in during that time asking uh, whether era is compatible with uh, Microsoft SQL always on availability groups. Yeah, so our, our core, uh, core capability with ERA not only gives you the ability to do standalone instances, but we can actually deploy uh, clustered instances. So things like uh, SQL Server always on availability groups, we, we absolutely support. Um, we give you that capability of deploying a database and automatically putting it within an AAG. So imagine the complexity behind uh, you know, deploying an operating system, deploying SQL Server, deploying the database, setting up the failover cluster, that AAG relies on, and also deploying the, the availability group itself. So we automate all of that within our core framework and can and do it within 20 minutes, uh, end to end. So it's a pretty cool capability. And we can also do that with other database vendors. We can do Oracle Rack, we can do HA Postgres, et cetera. So it's really part and parcel to the core platform and what makes it enterprise. Cool. Um, and another one I wasn't able to answer, I know about how you can try out the kind of um, base hyperconvergence platform. Are there trials you can get for the higher order technologies you were just showing us that are maybe cloud-based sort of thing uh, so people can poke at it? Sure, yeah. So take, uh, take Zybeam, for example. There's a, there's a trial that you, can, that you can register for there. Uh, for, for 15 days, you can connect it to your, your given environment so you can see what kind of cost optimization that, that Beam might, uh, might give you. Um, we also, for, say, things like COM, uh, we have something called Test Drive. I highly recommend you check it out on Nutanix.com. Um, just look for Test Drive. You'll have the ability to get your own uh, really Nutanix cluster, mini cluster, if you will, running in the cloud, where we have a step-through walk-me demo that would show you how we do things with our analytics uh, for example, like some of our machine learning and, uh, and, and, and analytics, but also how, we, how you can do blueprint-based deployments with uh, Nutanix.com. Um, so definitely ch check out Nutanix Test Drive for that as well. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. It's a big green button that says Test Drive. You can't miss it. So <laughs> hop over it. there and check that out. Awesome. awesome. Thank you, Mike, for joining us on the EcoCast today. It was great to have you. Oh, thank you. With that, uh, I've got one more gift card to give away and then a few uh, kind of wrap-up announcements that I want to leave you guys with. First of all, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It's been a fun EcoCast, and I hope you uh, learned a lot. Note that there are some handouts here uh, in your attendee console. You can grab those and take them with you. Um, 
Our final gift card winner is Danny Ponce from Arizona. Danny, congratulations. We will be reaching out to get that uh, delivery of that gift card arranged. Real quick before you go, I uh, want to bring your attention to a couple of things. One is Actual Tech Media runs a brief podcast called 10 on Tech, where we have the same sorts of conversations that we were having here on the Ecocast today, but uh, in a very compressed manner. Those shows are usually about 15 minutes long. I, James Green, am your host, and um, I really enjoy doing that. Definitely go and look that up in the um, iTunes, Google Play, uh, Stitcher, now Spotify. You can find us anywhere you find your podcast. I would love to have you as a uh, listener to that show as well, and hope you find it useful in the same way the Ecocast is useful to you. Uh, if you are attending this event today, and you're a vendor who might be interested in sponsoring an Ecocast or Megacast, we would love for you to reach out to us at connect at actualtechmedia.com, and we can talk with you about what that looks like. It's super fun, and um, we love presenting stuff like this to our engaged audience. And then finally, I want to make you aware of an event coming up next week. This is next Thursday. It's another Ecocast on supporting emerging AI, ML, and data science initiatives. And um, I think that's going to be a really interesting one. I'm actually not hosting, but I might attend myself because it's going to be it's going to be a pretty cool one. And I think we could all agree that this is a hot space right now. So it would be best uh, to get out ahead of that. So I hope you'll join us for that one. You can go to events events.actualtechmedia.com to register for that. And I hope that I'll see you there. Thanks everybody for joining us on this Ecocast. It was great to have you. Have a great day.